OK, the scam baiting videos I've made for this channel have been pretty popular and people keep asking me for more. That leads to an interesting supply problem. Because although I do receive a phenomenal number of scam emails and I try to play nearly all of them, only a very small proportion turn out to go anywhere at all. And even fewer of them wrap up in a way that makes for a complete and entertaining video. So while we're all waiting for the next big one to finish, let's take a look at some of the flops and failures. These are the scammers who dumped me. So here's one from Evelyn Herrenbert saying, donation, wait, D zero nation. Now, I don't know what idiot it was who suggested that you just reply OK to scammers, but that's what I did. My reply didn't go to Evelyn Herrenbert, but instead to someone called Mavis. Mavis was kind enough to explain that having won $758 million, she decided to change her life and do God's work on behalf of Microsoft, wait, um, Microsoft and Google in memory of Michael Jackson and give me $2 million. Simple, obvious and sensible, so I replied it must be some sort of mistake. Are you sure you got the right person? Mavis said, what will it profit me to hurt you or play with your feelings when I know how much I care about people out there and want the best for? I really can't force you to proceed, it's a matter of your own decision, okay? Have a nice moment. So I thanked Mavis and I said, I'm just confused. Why are you giving money away? Why to me? Mavis just sent the first long rambling and convoluted story again. So I continued to play innocent and asked again, are you sure you contacted the right person? What is this about? And that was it. Well, actually, there were a few more rounds of exactly the same conversation, but nothing seemed to be working. We couldn't get through to the actual scammer here. The conversation just fizzled out. Next, diplomat Charles C. Valley wants to inform me that my funds of 6.5 million have been approved for immediate delivery to me reconfirm my full names and details so there will be bone error during delivery of the funds. I replied, Dear Charles, some sort of mistake I wonder. I don't have any such fund. I think you might have dialed the wrong email. Now sometimes this play of innocence is exactly what gets the scammer firmly on the hook but not this time. Charles took me at my word and I never heard from him again. Patricia Chandler emailed me to say you were chosen to receive my cash grant donation of 500,000 USD. Pretty small fry for me, I would say. Respond back for more details. I responded, OK. Six months later, Patricia Chandler emailed me to say, you were chosen to receive my cash grant donation of 500,000 USD. I responded, OK. Hello? Six months later, Patricia Chandler emailed me to say, you were chosen to receive my cash grant donation. I replied, you've emailed me about this several times in the past, but then you never answered me. Nothing. I tried again. Please would you be kind enough to respond? You've emailed me many times with this interesting offer and I have replied, yet you never seem to continue the conversation. But there was no reply. I guess I'll wait another six months then. Next we have a message, indeed a second notice, I never received the first one, from someone who claims to be an air hunter from Air Hunters Debt Recovery Unit Team of the Detectives. In 1992 a helicopter flew above some trees to create an establishing shot. Later some people got out and drove a car through a big pond in a way that suggests adventure. Then they got into a boat and travelled across the ocean at moderate speed. Today they live quietly among us, watching, waiting for their chance to leap into action. If you've won the Google Lottery, if you have the same name as a dead millionaire, if you're trying to reclaim a box of Libyan gold, and if you can trust them, maybe you can hire the Air Hunters, Debt Recovery Unit, Team of the Detectives. snappy name. Now they want to help me claim £750,000 sterling left to me by a deceased client. On reflection, I probably should have played on the name now with head part, but instead I just replied OK. Nothing happened. So we'll look at some of the other scammers who dumped me in a moment, but first an answer to one of your frequently asked questions. Today's question is how do people even fall for these scams? This question gets asked a lot in many different ways. Some simply can't believe how anyone could be stupid enough. Others say anyone who gets scammed this way must be greedy or dishonest and therefore deserves to be scammed. I happen to think it's a bit more complex and nuanced than that. Firstly, let's recognise that the division between people who would never fall for a scam and potential victims is not actually a sharp line at all, but it's in fact a continuum. For the sake of convenience, we'll call one end sceptic and the other end gullible. So where do we put the people who say things like this? Imagine if it wasn't a scam and you just turned it down. Of course it's unlikely these people really believe it's real, but we can't place these people right at the sceptical extreme. And so it is. For any position you might occupy on this scale, there's someone else who's slightly more impressionable than you. 
and the same is true right up to the other end of the scale. So that's one factor. Victims don't necessarily have to be greedy. There are people who are just innocent or gullible enough or hopeful to believe it, just enough to be suckered in and scammed. Next, let's talk about that hope. Imagine you are at a particularly low ebb in your life. Maybe you just lost your job and you're at risk of becoming homeless. Or maybe a loved one died of cancer. Perhaps your business is failing. Or maybe your own health is suddenly threatened. You're feeling completely lost and there seems little hope to be seen anywhere. You're not in a great mental state and your ability to make sensible judgments may be compromised. Then along comes false hope in the form of a surprise windfall. Now maybe you won't lose your home. Maybe the scammer spins a story about a widow dying of cancer and you're inspired that now you can donate to that cancer charity that helped your own loved one. Now maybe your business is saved. Now maybe you can pay for the medical care you need. When there isn't much apparent natural hope, people will cling all the harder to anything that looks like hope. It's human nature, and the scammers are quite happy to exploit it. None of these scams have to fool everyone. The scammers cast their net incredibly wide and may send their opening emails out to tens of thousands of people. They only have to strike home to one or two people, and the scam is, from the point of view of the scammer, still a success. And there's just one last thing to say. You may very well think you could never fall for one of these scams, and I sincerely hope you're right, but don't get cocky. Not all scams are as laughably poor as the ones I make fun of on this channel. There are scammers out there who may know just the right tricks to catch you off guard, and just the right buttons to press in your brain to seem credible to you. It's better to stay a bit scared about this rather than believe you're immune. So anyway, let's return to the scammers who dumped me. Next, Kenneth Ferrugia, supposedly a Maltese banker, went to great lengths to explain to me that he needed to present me as the rightful heir to a bank account containing 42 million US dollars from one of his bank's deceased customers who, as we can see, shares a surname with my completely made up name. As usual, the scammer assured me that, although this all sounds highly illegal to an outsider, it's perfectly normal and above board. Nobody's getting hurt, and indeed it's dictated by the dynamics of the banking industry that he must do this. So I said, oh, I don't know, Kenneth, that sounds like it might not be legal. Kenneth was quick to reiterate there was nothing legal about this deal, and besides, someone close to him had recently become very ill and needed an operation. So as they say in Chinese, which I guess must be the official language of Malta now, thoroughness is what's needed here. So there's nothing illegal, I'm doing absolutely nothing wrong or taking any risk, there's no wrong on my part, however there must be serious confidentiality, and we have names and families to protect. So I said, OK Kenneth, if you're sure, then let us proceed. Kenneth wrote back with the inspiring words that the biggest risk in life is not taking any at all, and the greatest mistake is living in constant fear that we will make one. Now, I don't know, personally I can think of bigger risks and greater mistakes than living a quiet life, but no matter. The rest of Kenneth's email was just very florid waffle about the arrangements. I replied, it sounds like this is going to be very complicated. I'm not sure I can deal with that. Undeterred, Kenneth assured me it would not be complicated in any way and then continued to write word after word on the arrangements. Now we come to the kicker. An advance fee is required by the solicitor. Who will arrange for the forgery of the dead guy's signature? $85,000 no less for this service. But not to worry, Kenneth would arrange a short-term loan. I wrote, I know you're doing your best to reassure me and I thank you for this but one or two things in your email worried or confused me. Firstly, what's the role of a signature expert? I just didn't understand that part, sorry. But more importantly, the part about a payment of a large sum of money, I don't have anything like these sorts of funds. Am I expected to pay fees in advance here? To my enormous surprise, Kenneth says he has trouble securing a loan, and in order not to raise any eyebrow, he would use his family's rice field as collateral on the loan, presumably from a loan shark or some such. Food is more important than money, and so I told Kenneth this, and I said I think you would be best advised not to risk your rice field on this transaction. Keep the field, grow and eat the rice. Don't chase after money you can live without. But there was no stopping Kenneth. He said he went to the loan institution and had secured the loan using his uncle's rice field as collateral. He obliquely pointed out how this made me significantly beholden to him now, both in terms of trust, confidence and commitment. OK, sure. I replied, don't do it. Please don't risk your family's rice field on this venture. It isn't worth it. Cancel the loan now. It's a bad idea to proceed with this. I sense deep trouble ahead, and I have to tell you right now that if this deal runs into trouble, it will be absolutely impossible for me to assist financially in any way. Please take my advice on this. Your life was fine before you ever heard of this inheritance. You'll be fine without it. And perhaps he believed me because that was the last I ever heard from Kenneth. I tried several times to spark up the conversation again, but nothing. End of play. Next, Mr. Howard Herman has an urgent proposal for me. I replied, your usage of the word urgent makes this sound quite urgent. I am replying as instructed. This is my reply. Howard's proposal was, of course, the $48 million bank balance of an intestate deceased client. Urgent need. My assistance. Nothing to worry about. Risk-free. Keep confidential. All completely crystal clear. So I replied, I don't understand any of this. Howard said, please read it carefully. That's the proposal I have you. I said, the proposal contains 707 words. This is too many for me to understand. Howard responded, just follow my instructions and everything will be okay. 
and pressed on to give me further instructions, the usual stuff. A request to have all the sort of personal data that you should never share with strangers on the internet. I said I don't understand your instructions. It was a lot to read, and by the time I reached halfway through it, I'd forgotten the beginning part. I tried reading in parts, but that didn't really help. Can you help with this? Apparently he could not, as I never heard from him again. Next, Washington De Silva says this might come as a surprise to you. You've been picked to receive a donation. Please contact the Donor Foundation for more information. I replied, Guthway, Ruga Utu Obsuwaus I Awiawa, Kugle Si U Bwaus Risi Bwazer. And it's almost as if I was speaking nonsense or something, as there was never any reply. Mr. Hashimoto says, Feedback for a deal, $32.5 million. In my bank, reply for more detail if interested. I replied, Interested. The deal appears to be, I provide some details, he gives me $32.5 million, no particular reason why. I said, $32 million is too much money for anyone to handle. Can you reduce the amount at all? Apparently not, as he never replied. Christopher Poise wants my help in smuggling 240 kilos of gold out of Libya. The gold was the property of Christopher's deceased client, who was an ex-minister ally of Gaddafi. As usual, everything about this transaction is 100% legitimate and will never bring trouble of any kind, now and after the completion of the transaction, despite the fact that Christopher's client was allegedly assassinated in unknown circumstances. Very reassuring. I wrote, Dear Mr. Crispather, This is really weird. Why are you contacting me, a complete stranger to you, for help? I don't know anything about this matter. Also, isn't it illegal for someone who's not the rightful owner of this gold to pretend that they are? Furthermore, given that your last client was assassinated, how can you guarantee the safety of your next client? Have you considered there may be a curse on this gold? Thanks, and sorry for so many questions. Christopher was quick to reassure me that his client was killed for political reasons, which were nothing to do with the massive hoard of gold. And there's nothing illegal about falsely presenting me as his heir. I mean, sure, why not? So I said, Hi Christopher. Your BBC link about the death of your former client did not work. Please could you provide that detail? Does the article also mention the gold? Was your original arrangement with your former client also such that you would take half of the gold? That seems like quite a high percentage fee. Christopher sent me a link to the BBC article which doesn't mention assassination at all and just that the ex-minister drowned in the Danube. He also tried to explain that 50% of the gold was just his normal service fee. Nice work if you can get it. Also, we could appease the soul of the dead minister by donating some part of the money to charity, or like whatever makes your questions stop, you know? I said, Dear Critzifer, I am confused. The article does not say he was assassinated. It says he might have fallen in the river and drowned. Why don't you just tell the vault company the facts and let them give you all the gold? I'm saying that I don't understand why you need me at all in this matter. Christopher continued spinning his story, inventing some weird nonsense about why the assassination was never properly reported together with some blather about urgency... Then, the reassuring statement that there is no illegality involved in this, hence you must not entertain fear. I replied, Dear Christopher, how did you get to hear about that when it's not even in the news? Did Shukri Ganem mention to you personally that he had no intention of swimming in the River Danube? Also, this happened seven years ago. How is it that you're only now trying to resolve the matter of the gold? Furthermore, if the gold was Shukri Ganem's legal property, should it not be inherited by his wife or children? Have you contacted them about this? A few days passed and Christopher had not replied, so I wrote, Dear Christopher, I don't know why you stopped replying. Is everything okay? Are you safe? Christopher said in so many words that since his client had never mentioned the gold to his family while he was alive, it was fair game now he was dead. And besides, he left them enormous wealth. I replied, Dear Christopher, I would have thought that Shukri Ganem's family would be the legal heirs of his property regardless whether they knew about it or not. Is that not how inheritance works? Have you consulted a lawyer about this? You did say your plan was 100% legal. So what's the story there? I gave him the phone number of my disposable pay-as-you-go sim and said perhaps you could arrange to call me to explain the legality of what you're proposing. I am forbidden by law to break the law, so as long as it's indeed legal, there should be no problem. By the way, I keep my mobile phone switched off most of the time in order to avoid the risk of magnetism from the mobile handset. This seemed to make the scammer a little bit angry, which in turn always makes me a little bit happy. Christopher said, Sincerely in your heart and sure, you know very well how or who you sound like. You don't mean to tell you that because you know that I know your type. So what are we doing here? I said, Dear Chidstifer, I found your email hard to understand. It's almost as if you're upset about something. What's the problem exactly? Please could you provide your phone number so I can call you. Perhaps the email's not a good medium for communication. Christopher just said, Call me on this number. I wasn't ready, so I made an excuse. Dear Christopher, Sorry, I was unable to call due to a personal emergency. I'll try to call tomorrow. Meanwhile, is there anything else we can do to progress this matter? A couple of days later, Christopher just said, Call me. Let's talk. I said, Dear Christopher, I have been trying to call you, but I could not get through. The number you gave me has a Ghana dialing prefix. I thought you said you were in Libya. Please could you supply the correct number? 
He didn't reply. I tried one more time. Dear Krititna Safa, please could you send the correct phone number on which I can contact you? But alas, no response. I guess I should have called him, but I think he'd probably twigged by this point that I was just wasting his time. Perhaps now I think about it because I misspelled his name ten different ways. And so that concludes part one of the scammers who dumped me. In part two, which is coming soon, we have more gold. We have a mandatory scam. I fall in love with a soldier and I get invited to join the Illuminati. But for now, thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.